Good. Okay, thank you, Dennis and Peter. And uh, yeah, so I'm involved in this uh, particular deposit because uh, this is a part of my PhD research. And uh, you have seen some uh, UBC inversion result yesterday. So I did those inversion for airborne and uh, ground survey. And uh, Dom Fournier also contributed to this research. He carried out the borehole uh, EM inversion. And Doug Onoberg, who is the first author um, in the proceeding, he's supposed to give a talk, but uh, he has class to teach this afternoon, so I'm up. OK, so you have seen um, lots of talks from uh, different companies doing the EM service. So basically, this is a very unique site, I think. So we have so many different EM services at a single place and offers us a great opportunity to do inversion investigation. So ultimate goal would be, can we find one common conducting model that is consistent or can be explained by of the data set. That's our dream. Uh, just brief outline. So now we are capable of inverting any type of EM data set in 3D uh, in UBC GIF. And we have de developed all different kinds of code to do like time domain, Frix domain, natural source, control source, potential field, all kinds of data set collected in mining geophysics. And for this particular, data, uh, for this particular site, we're going to concentrate on four types of data set, natural source, airborne time domain, ground time domain, and borehole time domain. And I will show some 3D version results. Those results are going to be a little different from the model showed yesterday, because I have done some uh, up, up, uh, updated results. And then we will try to find a uniform model. So this is a kind of a cartoon, shows uh, the typical survey you can do at uh, at a mine. So we have a source from a lighting, maybe natural source, maybe source carried by a helicopter, maybe on the ground. So the first data set that we're going to do is a heli time survey, time domain, airborne. And another data set is a Z time from Geotech. It's airborne, freaks domain, but use a natural source. Uh, for the, on the ground, we use a squeeze survey collected by Discovery and uh, features a powerful squeeze sensor. And we also do downhole uh, EM inversion using the post EM data set. So, just to give you an idea of uh, the relative locations of the data set I'm going to use. So, this, um, this is current system in UTM. So, you just, um, for this set, Z time, head time, surface loop with squid. And you can see I use, where's the laser point? Uh, this one? Okay. And this guy is. Uh, projection of the ore body on the surface, this plan view. And it gives you a close up look. So the big loop and the red, uh, green dots are squid receivers and uh, those are drill holes and the, with the uh, ore body. So quite a nice data set. So for the rest of my talk, I'm going to use um, the local coordinate system. So you have to, so I've seen people using different coordinate system, but for my talk, the current system will be something like this. So you may have to remember the location for the um, uh, our body somewhere like x equal 2,000, maybe y 5,600, something like that. 5,600, 5, something like that. Uh, before the inversion, I'm going to say something about our inversion strategy. In order to find a connected model that fits the data, I have to minimize this uh, object functional. Two parts. Phi D is data misfit. So basically, just measures the uh, distance between your predicted data of current model and your observed data. And uh, another thing we need to trade off is moral norm. So basically, this measures the complexity of the conductive model. You don't want too much structure in there, but you need enough structure to be able to predict data. So there's always trade off, which is controlled by the beta. And for the inversion, it's, yeah, it's straight inversion. So it's more complicated than plate modeling. So there are lots of uh, parameters you can play with in straight inversion, but basically some are very important. For example, the data uncertainty. So which balance the relative importance of data. Sometimes you have data with higher noisy, you want a higher uncertainty to it, otherwise the data is going to be um, dominated by some noisy 
noisy data. And also important thing is the reference model. You want a good initial guess of the model. Otherwise, you may be too far away from the true answer. Yeah, so I'm not going to talk too much about details, but I will see some just the basic practitioner, practitioners need to know. This is a workflow we usually follow. So first, we need to get some reasonable estimate of data uncertainty. The rule of thumb is sometimes we use percentage of data plus floor if you don't have more information. And they'll have to discretize the earth in 3D. You really use mesh, 3D mesh, like this, it looks like this. For the reference model, if you don't really know something about it, just use half space or some reasonable guess. It's important to, to, to know there's such a thing called the Tickknopf curve, which is, uh, shows a function um, of a date misfit and um, model norm, phi m. So at the start of the, at the starting of the inversion, we start always with something with large data misfit, but very simple model, so it's somewhere here. And uh, as the inversion iterates, so we can reduce data misfit gradually, but the model norm got to increase. Basically means we're getting more compli complicated structure in the model. And then we need to find a point where we have acceptable data misfit and the acceptable amount of structure. So this is a trade-off. So we call this one as target misfit. So we're gonna pick the model from this iteration as a model for interpre interpretation. So this is sometimes can be tricky, especially for the real data set, in which cases the noise level is really unknown. So that time inversion, just uh, some uh, plot of uh, the, the data from uh, Ge Geotech. And we can clearly see the power line here. So very simple uh, fix to this is just get rid of them. So the inversion is 200 meter cell, horizontally 50 meter vertically. And for the uncertainty, I first do individual, to, um, one frequency inversion for those individual frequencies. Then just balance them accordingly. Then each frequency gonna have a frequency dependent for floors for the uncertainty. Starting model is 3,000 ohm meter half space, just nothing in it. And it shows the date fitting. On the left, the observed. On the right, it's predicted just 180 hertz for all four components. Looks pretty good, reasonable. So this is an inversion model. The top panel's depth slice, 900 meter deep. It's not absolute elevation, it's uh, relative to the surface. Always like that in my, in my presentation. And this one is a cross section where we just uh, cut across the, um, the, the deposit. So you can take the, the those are, uh, black lines are just uh, wired our lines for the our body. You can take it as reference. So I think the good, good thing is that at large scale, we figure out the regional structure by setting the version from this uh, regional conductor. And, all, uh, and this conductor is kind of part of, of, kind of get connected with the deposit, which is good. And on the cross section, we see the depth of um, the recovered conductor. It shows kind of a consistent with what we know from the drill hole information here. Uh, but the thing is, uh, for that time data, there's no information about conductivity background. So just look at the number here. It's a little bit underestimated, I think, for a typical VMS deposit. So let, let's just keep this question in mind and take a look at some other data set. Then highly time data, this is just uh, from one particular time channel. And take a profile, say it's kind of a little noise for late times, but we, we, we do see the, uh, the bump here which shows the existence of a good conductor. Again, there's a power line issues and the culture, some infrastructure on the surface. So to handle this, okay, so the mesh is a 200 meter horizontally, vertically 50 meter, it's kind of a coarse scale. But for the noise, we did low, low pass filtering to kind of a fight against noise. Sometimes you have a power line, you just have things like this, which is to basically just smooth out and uh, get rid of it. And we also don't sample the data on a 15 by seven grid, so we don't have that many transmitters, so the inversion can be done within reasonable time. 
starting model, 100 meter, ohm, uh, 100 meter uh, uh, ohm meter half space. So this is the date fitting. So on the left, observed data. On the right, predict data. So the color here is a little, it's not as dark as this side. It's just because I use the floor of uncertainty of a 10 to minus 12. 10 to minus 12 is like a uh, green or blueish here. So that's why we're not getting the dark blue uh, like here. But uh, in terms of um, the high values, I, I think the date fitting is pretty good. So this is a model, same, uh, depth slice and, and the cross-section. So the things for high time inversions is the conductor recovered just below the, 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 the drill or body. But I think the good news is that it has a pretty good assessment on the overall conductivity. It has the information about the background conductivity. And the original trend is very obvious. Yeah, the thing is just the conductor is a little deep. For the squeeze data, so as uh, Dennis has said, okay, so the big loop, two lines, smaller loop, two cross lines, looks like this. Good, got, got pretty good coupling with the deposit. And uh, take a look at the quality of the data, it's very good. It's very, very early time and very late time, and even at the latest time, the data quality is very, very nice, very clean data. So I love the inversion. Uh, we love the inversion with this kind of data set because it doesn't need too much uh, uh, data processing. But still, yeah, for data like this, it still needs some sort of a massage to the uncertainty assignment. So the inversion is 100 meters cell size, 50 meters vertically. Um, I did, did the removal of some suspicious data. Sometimes I just can't explain them, they're just uh, outliers. And 10% of data as a uh, Uncertainty plus a small floor. Starting model, thousand meter, oh meter half space. And the, uh, this is a date fitting from a one particular sounding here. So I think it's reasonably good. Yeah, so on the plan view, I think the squid data did a very good job locating the deposit horizontally. So you can see the black lines and the the red spot here is just uh, overlapping exactly, almost 100%. If you are gonna drill, you just drill the red, it's just right on the target. <laughs> but, but the thing is, if you look at the, the depth slice, uh, sorry, it's the cross sections. So it looks like uh, the tops of target is uh, better revealed. But it's kind of getting stuff underneath. And also the conductivity value is a little too high. It's like, uh, uh, 1,000 centimeters per meter, which is kind of an overestimate, I think. Yeah, this is for squid. And the last one, the POS-EM, which is done by Dawn. And uh, the, the data, as you've seen, is, uh, so on this plot, the raw data is just a little uh, dashed line, so a little noisy. So we decided we're gonna do some smoothing to be able to handle this, this data set in inversion. So basically it did like a stacking, spatial stacking, just um, um, makes 3D mesh and um, find all the receivers inside each cell and then just stack them, do some sort of averaging, then we end up with a smoother curve like the solid line. And when I put all those wells together, we form a date volume in 3D and we're gonna just invert the whole 3D date volume. And we take all drill holes, like I think it's 70 different drill holes in one inversion. So all data sets are taken into account. So cell size 30 meter because we need to handle the uh, small scale structure near the uh, ore body. And uh, yeah, we did stacking to kind of uh, get rid of the noise and get data a little bit smoother to, e it's just easier to work with. And the model start, the inversion starts with a thousand O meter half space. Just assume we don't know anything about it. And this data fitting, so the data fitting is not perfect, certainly, because this is still a research in progress. We're gonna do more investigation on this, but I think basically we captured the big features. Let's just take a look at the results. So this is depth slice at different depths. So this one's 800 meter deep. This is 1100 meter. So, not sure if you can see the 
plug the, the wire for the ore body. It did a decent job finding the uh, one side of the ore body. And if you look at the cross section, it had different uh, northing. So it's, it's pretty good. It's, it's got the, uh, high, the high, con high, high conductivity just at the depth of uh, the drilled ore body. And uh, also, this is not just for one cross section. So this one got those guys, and uh, if we go a little, little further north, we also got those uh, deeper um, conductors. I think this potentially associated with those some stringer sulfide. And uh, there's another cross section. I do uh, another diagonal cross section. It's just along the dipping direction of the the, uh, the ore body, and uh, you just look at this. So this is a ore body, a drilled ore body, and it's recovered the uh, conductive conductor by bore inversion. So great correlation between the massive sulfide and this guy. And uh, inter interestingly, found lots of highly conductive bodies down there, like below, about or below 1,200 meter. And uh, I think this is very interesting. This uh, has, it's, it's got a big story there. Yeah, so the good news is that we got high resolution image to target, but the data is kind of localized. The data is a little more complicated than surface airborne data. So just compare the cross sections. They attempt to be able to map the global large scale thing gradually get to smaller scale, use the helitam, and then we use squid to find the uh, deposit, at, at deposit scale and the uh, reasonable details about our body. Then at the finest scale, post EME version is able to pinpoint the uh, exact location or depth of the, 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 the our body, which is really nice. So on the depth slides, so the two airborne surveys find the regional trend. There is um, from southwest to northeast, maybe, yeah, there's a regional trend, the conductive regional trend there. And the two deposit skill surveys, the squid and the downhole, and got a reasonable image about uh, the conductor. So just brief summary, we did four independent inversion in 3D. They all find the the lower deposit. So the but the bad news is they all look different. So some shallower, some deeper, some more conductive, some less conductive, some left, on the right. It's just uh, something there, just but different. Okay, <laughs> that's bad news. But the good news is that's because they bear independent information, right? So it's, they have independent information, so it got different results. So if we can combine those information together, we're able to approach the truth, right? So that's why we are looking for a unified model. So basically, we have now at this moment, we have two ways of doing this. One is to join invert this set with the same algorithm. For example, we just join invert heli time squeeze because they are both time domain EM survey. Another way is just that we do corp creative inversion. So in, in this case, we use a model from heli time squeeze join inversion as starting background model for Z time inversion because we know Z time is not able to tell the conductive background. So that's the basic logic here. So the for joining version, we're gonna use our time domain inversion code for heli time to squeeze data. One additional trick here is to do that relative data weighting, because based on this uh, IO curve, the Tikhonov curve, at some point we may pick up this model for heli time inversion. This gives you a particular phi D, the bit misfit. But because of the maybe the squeeze survey, which is a surface survey, has may have a different number of data, so the phi D may be smaller. So we need additional parameters to adjust the relative importance of two data sets. So we did that, and the, the inversion, this is an inversion with only squeeze data, so I've seen before. Uh, with the joint inversion, with the tele time information incorporated, cover something like this. So on the plan view, we, we can see this model is more compatible with the regional trend. So from southwest to northeast, which is the information in heli time. And also we got rid of those uh, guys like uh, this little conductor, this arm here, they're gone. So just one, one, one conductor at the center. 
and on the cross section, the um, the, uh, the crazy conductivity value are gone. It's kind of a little smoother, but the depths still similar. Yeah, so I think the depths of uh, the target stay the same, which suggests the depth estimation from the threading version is kind of reliable because this depth is supported by multiple inversions from different uh, data set. Conductivity more realistic, which is better. And uh, yeah, so more compatible regional strand, uh, with regional trend. Another in, so then we do the cooperating for inver inversion. So we need to work with this model norm. So we have to use um, the model we just saw as a reference, with reference, as a ref reference model for Z-time inversion. So that time inversion needs this um, uh, background model to compute the uh, primary field and also for the initial model. We just plug it in and let it run. So this is a model from um, Halitam plus squid, the joint inversion. So color may look a little different because I changed color scale. And after this, this is a Z time inversion result constrained by Halitam and the squid information. So pretty much the same in terms of conductor, but the conductivity is much higher than Zatam alone inversion. So you compare the value here. And the, yeah, so I would say this Zatam constrained inversion model is more uh, geologically plausible model because it's just the value of conductivity and the uh, compatibility with other data set. So just conclusions. We inverted four EM data set at the lower, and um, they have been very useful for interpretation. The lower deposit recovered, but they have different, um, they look very different. Then we tried to obtain a unified model by using joint inversion or cooperative inversion. So we are able to obtain more plausible model and by incorporating multiple EM data set. Again, this is a research in progress and uh, our ultimate goal is to be able to invert all EM data set, not just four. I think it's worthwhile to talk about some of the field work. So I think it's important to do more communication with the people who like to collect data. Sometimes the misunderstanding the data is a key learning inversion. We're gonna do the borehole inversion more carefully because uh, I know the data is more complicated. And uh, yeah, we like to take this opportunity to know more people, to know more data set. Hopefully you get more data set. And uh, later on we may develop uh, strategies and workflows. Then eventually we may, one day, maybe sometime, we present your beautiful model, which is compatible to our EM data set. I think uh, that's it. I'd last like to thank Hard Bay, Discovery, CGG, and Geotech for the data and the information. Thank you. Questions? I got one. So with the joint inversions, is it um, making just kind of a single inversion obsolete now? Do they still have a place if we can do joint inversions or when we can do joint inversions? Um, so right now the um, the joint inversion is pretty much depending on the type of data. So um, in principle, we're able to join invert all the data set. But right now, where we or we can invert just uh, this, as long as they are, for example, they are same time domain EM, we can put them together, it's no problem. But if another data set is time, uh, fixed domain, we may have a little trouble but eventually we'll do this. We're still investigating this, yeah.
Was there a question yeah. in there? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a statement of experience, Dennis. And it's always, it's just more complexity. I couldn't resist. <laughs> I, I can kind of explain the problem that you had, like you use VTAM result as the initial model. And doing version, the uh, ZTAM just uh, goes back to the what it would like to do. Yeah. Just to discard the, uh, the VTAM model. So but you may have to check the um, the alpha s parameter in the in, in the inversion to to make sure the smallest component in the model norm maybe is big enough so it's it's playing a role or whether you have to check whether you are using like there's a the formula here is um, you are sm you're looking for a smooth model you are looking for a smooth model with reference to your reference model, or whether you are like whether your reference model in, is in the smooth, smoothness part, a component, have to take look at that. If sometimes it's, it's, it's possible you are using the V10 model as starting model, but you are not really enforcing inversion to try to keep close to that model. So just because the, some parameters are not set properly, it's, it's very possible. I have seen that before. Okay. Every time we get an inversion, we have results. It doesn't matter what camera we took from the photograph, but we have results of when the TV or it was. Results. That's a question for you and also for Ken and for whoever is doing EM inversion. CGI is not here. Uh, or maybe Elliot maybe is here. When are we going to have results as a tensor? You mean a tensor? Tensor, yes. Re conductivity is a tensor, just like, just well, like magnetic you, you susceptibility. Mean, you mean have a, not, not, not like, a, like conductivity as a tensor. Basically, we're not doing one value. We're doing a tensor. Exactly, yes. That's yeah. uh, well. That's a valid question, but it just seems it's cost. I mean, you have to deal with more parameters, and uh, it's, uh, it's it's again it's a trade-off. You want more information? Sure, you can do it, but do you have enough resource to do that? Do you have enough time, computing power, the arg algorithm? It's, it's just the weather is worthwhile to invest in, to, to to do that. Well, and you are getting more information, or just a little bit more? More? Like, I think yeah. so. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Sure. Oh, I thought of another question. Well, anyway, I'll ask the, the main question for the Hut Bay guys. So again, in the inversions, there's some deeper conductance. Some are more striking than others. So you're the experts. You live there. You've got all that drill hole information. How realistic is that? Do you think that there might be something down there, or do you think it's just an artifact of the inversion? Or are you somewhere in between? Alan. Yeah, 
I think some results from the borehole survey is very interesting because uh, we, we may put big question mark on airborne surface survey, but for a borehole survey, I think because we have a sensor down there, right? Just right at just next door, just one meter away, like is there, we're gonna put lots of credibility on it. So, yeah. Thank you, Deacon, I think you better. Yeah. Move on before this turns into a Donahue thing. <laughs> and uh, you keep that. Don't give that to Doug. Okay. Right? <laughs> Thank you.